Hello, I'm Yuta Yeoman at Yale University, and I want to talk today about my research on cognition and emotion regulation in depression. Before I do that, however, I want to thank the important people who did this work, um, mostly my grad students, and I want to in particular thank Megan Quinn and Michael Vandalin, um, whose work I'm going to present um, today in my talk. But let me start out by giving you some numbers. Nearly 30 million Europeans and 20 million Americans are affected by some form of chronic depression, and this includes about 3 million children in the U.S. alone. According to the World Health Organization, depression is the leading cause of years of life lived with disability in the whole world. And if you're diagnosed with a major depressive episode, your mortality rate will be elevated by the factor 2.6 within a given year, which is in part due to the elevated risk of suicide that goes along with being depressed, but is also due to the detrimental effects that depression seems to have on physical health. It is, for example, the number one risk factor to die of a heart attack if you have a history of cardiovascular disease. As you probably know, to be diagnosed with a major depressive episode, you have to present with five or more of the following symptoms for at least two weeks. And what is important, these two symptoms need to include either depressed or irritable mood or diminished interest or loss of pleasure. This very clearly shows that depression is an affective disorder. It's about sustained negative affect, or difficulties experiencing positive effects. However, what I find particularly fascinating about depression is depressive cognition. Depression very clearly changes the way in which, in which we perceive ourselves, our future, and our environment. And I think this is very illustrated, nicely illustrated in these two paintings by Van Gogh, one of which, if you want to take a guess, was um, painted during a retrospectively, of course, diagnosed depressive episode. It's also very nicely illustrated, I think, in this quote by Andrew Solomon, um, a famous writer who throughout all his life is, has been suffering from very severe episodes of major depression. And he wrote a very noteworthy book about it called The Noonday Demon. And in this book, he writes about one of these depressive episodes. I remember bursting into tears because I had used up the cake of soap that was in the shower. I cried because one of the keys stuck for a second on my computer. The reality that I had to put on not just one, but two socks and then two shoes so overwhelmed me that I wanted to go back to bed. I started to fear every time my dog left the room that it was because he was not interested in me. The primary goal of my research is to try to better understand the role of cognition in depression. So how are we to understand those changes in cognition that you saw in the quotes by Andrew Solomon and in the pictures by Van Gogh? What are processes that may underlie depressive cognition? And most importantly, as I said before, depression is an affective disorder. So how are cognitive processes and changes in cognitive processes that go along with being depressed linked to the hallmark feature of depression, which again is either sustained negative affect or difficulties experiencing positive affect? To look at this more closely, let's think about how most depressive episodes start. Research shows that at least for first episodes of depression, these very frequently follow the experience of stressful life events. This isn't quite as true for recurrent depressive episodes, but for first episodes of depression, this seems to be very clear. So if you experience a stressful life event, you get divorced, you get in a fight with your best friend, you fail at school, you get a bad grade, anything like this, you will respond with negative affect. Um, and almost everybody will initially respond with negative affect. This isn't a depressive episode, obviously. And as we know, the majority of people, after a very brief period of time, will recover without any problems. However, for some people, this doesn't happen. Um, and out of this negative affect, they seem to spiral into something more severe that we then call a depressive episode. So how does this happen? We know from research in social psychology that people do not just passively experience the negative effect. In contrast, they're very active in trying to regulate it, a process we call emotion regulation. So what we may see here 
may be some kind of failure in emotion regulation. How do we self-regulate our affect when we're under stress? Bonanno and Burton wrote a very noteworthy paper in 2013 where they laid out some of the processes that are important in responding effectively to stressful life events. If you want to do this, you need to attend to salient features of the situation. You need to choose a strategy that best fits the situation. You need to continually monitor the situation and you need that to then change your, your response to the situation as needed. As you'll see, there are a lot of cognitive factors here. Things like attention, selection of a strategy, monitoring of the situation, and changing of the response to that situation. So cognitive processes actually may play a very important role in people's ability to effectively self-regulate their affect. And things like cognitive biases, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, but also difficulties in cognitive control may make it very, very difficult to exert the self-regulation and to effectively regulate negative affect, which may then lead into something more severe like a depressive episode. So we do think of depression in large part as a failure of self-regulation of negative affect. And we do think that understanding cognitive processes in depression, things like cognitive biases that go along with depression and maybe deficits in cognitive control, will help us understand these difficulties in emotion regulation, which then helps us understand depression risk better, which may also down the road then lead to new interventions for this very debilitating disorder. So let's first take a look at the role of cognitive biases. What evidence do we have that cognitive biases exist in depression and play a role in depression? And what is the empirical evidence of a link between cognitive biases and effective difficulties in depression or difficulties with emotional regulation? There's a long history of cognitive theories of depression and a lot of literature on the existence of cognitive biases in depression. Particularly, if we look at Beck's theory, it suggests that there should be biases in all aspects of information processing, including perception, attention, memory, judgment. The theory also predicts that bias processing is an important factor, not just in the onset and maintenance, but also in the recurrence of depressive episodes. However, if we look at the empirical evidence, it is unfortunately much more mixed. For example, memory biases, are indeed one of the most robust finding in the cognitive bias literature in depression. There is an old meta-analysis, for example, that shows that depressed participants recall up to 10% more negative than positive words. However, if we look at attention biases, the picture is much more mixed. There are a lot of inconclusive results, and most of this research was done using the dot probe task, which is a reaction time task that has been criticized um, as a measure of attention biases. And people have suggested that these inconclusive results may depend on stimuli, differences in stimuli that have been used, and may also depend on differences in exposure times that have been used. So in the first study that I want to present to you today, our goal was to use an improved measure of attention bias. It's something better than the reaction time tasks that have been used before, and um, to also systematically vary the exposure duration. So the idea in these theories is, for example, that depression may be more associated with difficulties in disengaging from negative material than with a bias in terms of orienting towards negative material, which is something that you may more likely see in anxiety disorders. So we wanted to test this um, explicitly. To do this, we used eye tracking. Eye tracking is a very direct measure of attention in that it measures your eye movement on a millisecond by millisecond basis. You get a continuous measurement of where your attention is at at any point in time. The study I want to present was done in collaboration with Alvaro Sanchez, um, who's now at the University of Ghent, and um, he was a visiting a graduate student in Melbourne. The goal was to develop an eye tracking task that would not just assess attention biases in depression, but would enable us to actually separate out different components of attentional processing in depression. So in a task that would allow us to separately look at engagement with negative information and at difficulties in disengaging from and again, the second important goal of the study was to then also link this with effective processing 
right, I'll get to this a little later. So how did we do this? Participants are presented with an initial central fixation cross for 500 milliseconds and are then presented with a random number and their task is to just say this random number out aloud. This is not any, this is not particularly important actually, this is just to focus them on the center of the screen. So once we know that their attention is at the center of the screen, we present two stimuli. These are two faces with differing emotional expressions, as you can see, a neutral face and an emotional face of the same actor. And the first thing that we do here is a natural viewing period. In the natural viewing period, we tell participants that they can look anywhere on the screen. Um, all they have to do is keep their eyes on the screen. And, we, and this lasts um, three seconds. Um, and this allows us to measure a lot, uh, actually a lot of different things. First, we can, we can assess which face, the neutral or emotional face, is first fixated. So what is the first fixation on the neutral or an emotional? And it gives us the number fixation frequency. So how many, how often did people attend the neutral versus the emotional phase? And it also gives us the total fixation time. So how long did people actually attend to the emotional phase versus the neutral phase? However, as I said before, a goal of the task was to actually separate out the engagement from the engagement component. The eye tracker has a nice feature that it can actually wait until it detect, detects a certain fixation and then can make the next trial dependent on having detected this fixation. So in these trials, what happens is that the eye tracker waits until it detects a fixation either on the neutral or on the emotional face, and then it presents a frame on the next trial around the other face. So for example, if it detects a fixation on the emotional face, it then presents a frame around the neutral face. We tell participants that once they see the, the frame, they have to respond to the frame as quickly as possible by telling us whether it's an oval or a square. So it's a little complicated, but it has two indices, which I hope are easy to understand. One is an engagement index. So the eye tracker waits for fixation on the neutral face and then presents a frame around the emotional face. And so what the participant now has to do is to disengage their attention from the neutral face, engage it with the emotional face and measure the time that this process takes. On the other hand, if the eye tracker waits for a fixation on the emotional face, it then presents the frame around the neutral face. And so this measures the time it takes participants to disengage their attention from the emotional face and to fixate on the neutral face. So this gives us separate indices of engagement and disengagement. We tried this task out with the with clinically depressed participants compared to control participants, and we presented happy faces, angry faces, and sad faces, each paired with a neutral face, as I showed show you before. So what were our findings? First, initial orientation. There were no group differences. What you can see here is that all of our participants, even the depressed participants, are more likely to initially orient towards the happy face, and less likely to initially orient towards the angry or sad face. Fixation frequency, same thing, no group differences. What you can see is that our participants, all of our participants, fixate more frequently on the happy face compared to the angry and the sad faces. Our first group difference appears when we look at total fixation time. What you can see here is that there's no difference in the happy faces between control and depressed participants. However, depressed participants spend more time looking at the angry face and they also spend more time looking at the set faces compared to the neutral faces. Nothing for our engagement index, so no group differences when people are asked to disengage from a neutral and engage with a happy, angry, sad face. However, we do get a group difference when we look at disengagement. And the group difference here is specific to the set faces. So nothing for angry faces, nothing for happy faces. But the depressed participants have a harder time disengaging from when we present the red frame around the neutral face. Is this related to stress responding and, and affect in the face of stress? To test this, we presented our participants with a stress task after they were done with the eye tracking portion of the study. And in the stress task, we asked people, we told people that they were supposed to give a speech in front of an audience and that we would record the speech. And um, and then we looked at their mood change in response 
to this to anticipating having to give the speech. And we try to predict this mood change by looking at our different attentional indices. And what you can see here is that the attentional bias is taken together explain about 42% of the variance in the mood change that we get in response to our stress challenge. However, when we split this up by depressed risk control group, we see that this is solely due to the depressed group and it is limited to disengagement from sad faces. So if you're in the depressed group, the harder it is for you to disengage from the sad faces when we prompt you to look at the, at the neutral faces, the more of an emotional response do you, ha you have to our stress task. So this not only shows that there seems to be a cognitive bias, which is difficulties disengaging from said material, but it also shows that this bias explains difficulties in responding to a stressful event or stronger responding to a stressful event. Let's return to the, the second cognitive factor I want to look at, which is individual differences in cognitive control. Cognitive control is an important set of cognitive processes that we employ to execute goal-directed behavior. There, is, there are a range of different processes that fall under cognitive control, um, inhibition, updating of information in working memory, and flexibility of manipulating information in working memory. As you know, working memory is a limited capacity system. It basically helps us to hold in, to hold in our mind all the information that is important to execute goal-directed behavior, but given that its capacity limitations, it is very important that it gets updated um, rather quickly. So if you think about the situation that you experience a negative flag event or a negative stressful event, in order to regulate your affect, you may have to update your working memory. You may have to sort of let go of the negative thoughts that were triggered by the negative affect that was the result of the life event and you may have to replace it with sort of more goal relevant information um, once your goal has shifted to, for example, now focus on other things um, than this upset that happened in your life. So we think that these cognitive control processes actually play a very important role in your ability to regulate affect and that depressed people may have difficulties in these processes, particularly when it comes to the processing of emotional material. To assess this, the first study I want to show you is a study on cognitive inhibition. Cognitive inhibition is important because, because it controls access to working memory of goal-irrelevant information. It, it discards goal-irrelevant information from working memory and stops, helps you to stop access of formally relevant information to working memory. So it's a very important mechanism that focuses your attention on current goal-relevant information. The question was, do depressed people show something like an inability to inhibit negative material. And may this explain why they may have difficulties with emotion regulation. To test this, we took a task that you're all familiar with. Um, so please name as quickly as possible the color in which the following word is written. Yeah, so this is green, obviously is the correct answer. But this is difficult to do because at the same time as you're focusing on the goal relevant information, which is green, you also have goal irrelevant information, which is the word, the color word, interfering um, with your with your answer. Um, this is obviously the well known Stroop effect. And there are individual differences in people's ability to override the goal irrelevant information and get the correct response. However, for everybody, you probably realized when you did the task that there was a certain period of time where there was basically equal activation of the distractor red and the target and that then there came a certain point in time where it was not difficult anymore to do the task. You could say green, you were not distracted by red as much anymore. And we think that this is a point in time where we actually have something that, something akin to active inhibition. Active inhibition of the distractor means that the activation that is associated with the distractor is actually suppressed below a baseline. And that's very important because we can measure this below baseline suppression. And we do this in the following task. Um, so again, we have a stroop word. Correct answer is green, distractor is red. And in this task, we follow this with another trial where the distractor red now becomes the target. So now on this trial, we have to say red. 
This is called a negative priming trial because if you're still inhibiting the distractor, it should be very difficult for you to then give the correct answer on the next trial because the correct answer is the distractor. We compare this with a control trial where you have to do the exact same thing, so say red down here, but the previous trial is not related um, to, um, to the answer on the test trial. So if you are indeed having having if you're indeed having inhibition of the goal around this information, then your response time in the negative priming trial should be much slower than your response time on the control trials, even though you're doing the exact same thing on both the trials. So we tested this looking at inhibition for negative stimuli in depression. Um, for this, we developed a negative effective priming task, which is very easy to do. Please say as quickly as possible whether the green word is positive or negative and ignore the red word. And then these words are presented really closely to each other so that this becomes very difficult to do. And so that's what the task looks like. This figure presents negative priming in milliseconds. And if the value is positive, that means that you're actually showing negative priming. So you're slower on the negative priming compared to the control trials. In green, you see responses to positive words. In red, you see responses to negative words. And here we have a depressed group, MDD. We also have a remitted depressed group. So these are people who had a depressive episode previously in their lives but are not currently depressed. And we compare this not only to controls who are currently in a neutral mood state, but also to controls who are in a negative mood state. Well, if you think that, that this is a very important test, because if this task is sensitive, to state negative mood, it may not be that interesting for our understanding of depression vulnerability. Yeah, a very strong test of depression vulnerability requires that we actually do not see these changes when people are under a transient negative mood state. So that's why I included this control. As you can see, for positive material, no differences among powerful groups. However, when we get to the negative material, you see that there is perfect inhibition for control participants who are in a neutral and a negative mood state. However, there is no inhibition for depressed participants or negative depressed participants. Is this in any way related to stress responding? We looked at this by looking at people's self-reported rumination scores. So how likely are you under stress, under negative mood, to start ruminating, which are which a number of studies have shown is a very maladaptive response to a stressful event. Um, and what you can see here is that self-reported tendency to ruminate is related to BDI, but even when controlling for BDI, we find that it is related to negative priming um, and um, negative priming specifically for negative words. So the lower your negative priming, the more likely you are to respond with rumination to a stressful event. And again, this is even controlling for BDI scores. To just show you another example that cognitive control may play an important role here, um, this looks at a different component of cognitive control, uh, which is updating. So we had inhibition first, and this is updating. So this is about manipulating material that you already have in working memory. The question here was, do depressed people have difficulties removing irrelevant negative information from working memory? task is very simple. Um, you learn two lists of words, each three words. Um, one list is green, the other list is printed in red. And as you can see, um, there, are, there are positive and negative words in these lists. We give you some time to learn both lists. And then we, after um, a delay, we present you with a frame. And the frame can either be red or green. If the frame is red, it means that the red list is relevant and you're supposed to forget the green list. Then we show you a probe, which can either be from the list you were supposed to remember, from the list you were supposed to forget, or it can be a completely new word um, that is either positive or negative. And all you have to do as a participant is tell us whether the, list, the word that you see is from the relevant list, yes or no. So we're looking at your reaction time. So pretty easy, you can see two lists, frame. So what we're looking at here are intrusion effects, which means that we're comparing the reaction time to say no 
to a word from the irrelevant list to the reaction time to say no to a completely new word of the same valence. So in both cases, the participant has to say no. But in one case, they have to say no to a word that was previously relevant that is not relevant anymore. In yellow, you see the controls. In green, the controls are in negative mood state, and in red, the MDD participants. And what you can see here is that everybody has intrusion effects, so it's harder to say no to a word that was previously relevant but is now not anymore than to say no to a completely new word. But um, what you also see is that there are no differences here between positive and negative words when we look at the control participants. However, if we look at the MDD participants, you see that for the negative words, the MDD participants have a particularly hard time to say no to a word that was previously relevant. Um, so they have increased intrusion effects. And again, this is related to stress responding. We looked at this again in relation to self-reported rumination. And again, controlling for the I scores, we do find a relation. The higher the intrusion effect, the more people are likely to say that they respond to stress with rumination. So to summarize, it seems like depression is associated with difficulties inhibiting negative material, with difficulties removing irrelevant material from working memory, and with difficulties manipulating negative material in working memory. And all of these difficulties seem to be related to rumination, which again has been proposed as particularly maladaptive responding to stressful life events and also has been shown to increase depression risk in response to stress related events. Okay, so just to summarize again, it seems like, yes, there are cognitive biases, particularly attention biases, and they are related to difficulties in stress responding or increased stress responding under an acute stressor. And there are difficulties in cognitive control that seem to be related to use of self-reported rumination that, as I've said before, has been shown to be a very detrimental response to, um, um, to negative effect. So what about responses that have been, that have often been described as adaptive? Are they also relying on these cognitive processes? May this explain another part of depression vulnerability, that depressed people are less likely to be able to use these adaptive strategies? To look at this, we focused on a strategy called cognitive reappraisal. Cognitive reappraisal has in many studies been shown to actually effectively regulate negative effect and to not have negative consequences on functioning um, as, for example, strat the maladaptive strategies like rumination um, have, have been shown to have. Reappraisal involves changing the interpretation of a situation in order to regulate emotional responding. And so this requires a lot of cognition. It requires that you actually let go of the prepotent interpretation of the situation that is related to your effective responding to the situation, that you rethink the situation, and that you come up with another interpretation that leads to different emotional responding. So our question was, is there any indication that the ability to use this strategy, again, that has been found to be adaptive, is related to cognitive control? And so may, may the problem be that given control, cognitive control deficits, this strategy is less available to people with depression. To look at this, we used um, this frequently used uh, reappraisal task. In this task, what people have to do is we do a mood, initial mood assessment. Um, then we show 3.5 minutes of a sad film clip. Um, this is taken from the movie with Chan. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. Um, this is about a boy who is in the process of losing his father. Um, and basically what you see during those 3.5 minutes is this boy crying into the camera. Um, then we get another mood assessment. Then people get a reappraisal cue where we tell them, okay, start reappraising. And we've done a reappraisal training with them before. Then we get another mood assessment. Then while they're doing the reappraisal, um, we show them another 4.5 minutes of the film, um, and then we assess their mood again. This gives us two mood assessments, um, one that we call reactivity, those would be the first 2.5 minutes, and a second one that we call regulation, which would be the final 4.5 minutes while they're actively trying to reappraise. After this task, we also give them a cognitive control task. This is the um, NBAC task, it's a two-back task. It's a very simple task. All you have to do is um, you basically have to 
compare words with words that were presented to before. And then you have to say whether they are the same or whether they're different. So here, windmill, torture, windmill. So the second windmill is the same as the first windmill, so you would have to say the same. And then you say windmill again, which is different from torture, which you see here, so you have to say different. And this just keeps going, so you always have to present two, um, two back. Try to back. This requires a lot of cognitive control. It requires keeping in, in working memory the words as they have been presented, inhibiting them when they're not relevant anymore. Um, and, um, and so this actually assesses a number of different um, cognitive control functions. This is first, just to show that the reappraisal task worked. Um, so here you see the mood changes. So people in sad mood increased from mood one to mood two. And then it decreased to mood three, where they um, did the reappraisal, and it further decreased to mood four, um, where, they, where we look at their full recovery. So this is just to show that actually we have reactivity and we also have recovery, as you can see. They, can, they basically go back to baseline. So is there a relation between their MDEC performance and mood? Um, what we're looking at here is how many errors do people make on the MDEC task? And we have two versions of the MDEC task, one in which we presented just neutral material, so words like windmill, chair, and things like that, and the other one in which we presented effective material, so things like torture, death, um, and, and, uh, and other um, valence words. What you can see here is that there is no, that of course, effective and neutral MDEC are correlated, um, but not as highly as to suggest that they're the same thing. And then you see a relation between the neutral MBAC and not mood reactivity, but mood recovery. So when people are using the reappraisal, this is often called online reappraisal because people are reappraising while they're experiencing mood state. Same for the effective MDEC. Here you also see a correlation not to mood reactivity, but to mood recovery. So to see if there's anything specific to the effective MBEC over the neutral MBEC, we put both of them into a regression, and what you can see is here the neutral MBEC predicting mood recovery. But when we put in the effective MBEC, you'll see that it's only the effective MBEC um, that is predictive of mood recovery. And it explains about 6% of the variance. This was a great study showing us that there seems to be a relation between cognitive control ability and the ability to use reappraisal when under stress. However, this was completely dependent on self-reported mood. So in this next study, what we wanted to look at was a more objective measure of reappraisal ability, which is an ERP component called the late positive potential. This is a midline ERP that becomes evident approximately 300 milliseconds following stimuli onset and it's supposed to reflect emotional intensity. So, the, so um, Greg Hitech, for example, has shown that the late positive potential reduced when people were told to reappraise versus when they were told to attend to a negative Im image. So in this um, next study, what we wanted to do was use the LPP as a more objective measure of reappraisal um, ability in that we predicted that the LPP should be reduced and that the reduction, the LPP reduction, should be related to individual differences in cognitive control. Um, this task was a little different because we had to adjust this for the ERP environment or EG environment. Um, so we had a 10 and reappraised trials. Um, again, there was some training in how to do the reappraisal. And, um, and then we also got self-reported sadness at the end. What we look at here are, again, NBEC errors in LPP what you can see is that there is, um, again, a relation between the neutral and effective NBEC, and there is no relation between the neutral NBEC and, and changes in LPP amplitude. However, um, there's a significant correlation between the effective NBEC and changes in LPP amplitude. And if, again, if we put this into um, a similar regression as before, you see that there is a specific relation between the effective NBEC, so the ability to exert control control when confronted with emotional material and the LPP amplitude when using reappraisal. And this explains about 10% of the variance. 
So cognitive control here was associated with the ability to use online reappraisal to downregulate sadness. Um, and we showed this using self-report as well as LPP attitude um, to look at reappraisal effectiveness. So let me switch gears a little bit. Um, if cognitive control is important for emotional regulation and may explain depression risk, then maybe we can also show that the individual differences in cognitive control do predict depression when people are under an acute stressor. And this was the goal of the next study. However, um, there's an additional complication. We know that cognitive control is stable, pretty stable developmentally. And this is a study done by Megan Quinn. So it's very stable, but there's also studies that show that there are actually changes in cognitive control when you are under an acute stressor. And this was Megan Quinn's idea. Um, you know, these are the wonderful grad students when they join your lab. Um, they you know, upset um, all of your theory. Um, so she um, looked at studies that showed that people show reductions in cognitive control when they are under a stress induction compared to control practices when not under stress induction. So it's possible that the moment when cognitive control is needed, it is impaired. And again, we've shown before that this may be very, have very important consequences for people's ability to regulate affect. So our model may need another error where stressful life events not just lead to negative affect, but they also may then lead to cognitive biases and mostly deficits in cognitive control, which may then lead to um, failure in regulation, which may then explain how negative affect turns into something like a depressive episode. So the idea here is that changes in cognitive control or individual differences in those changes in cognitive control when you are in an acute stressor may predict depression symptoms during a particularly stressful um, time in life. The way that we looked at this is we recruited 51 college freshmen um, and we tested them during the first weeks of their freshman year um, to see if we could predict their depression symptoms during final speak at the end of the semester. The way this was done is we assessed initial depression symptoms. We then measured cognitive control using the same NBAC test that you've seen before. They then underwent stress induction using the TRIO social stress task. And then we measured cognitive control again. So we have pre and post stress induction cognitive control. And then we waited until they got to finals week and measured depression symptoms. These are some of the questionnaires. So we have a negative life events questionnaire um, and we looked at the back inventory to assess depression symptoms. Again, the measure of cognitive control is the NBAC task that we've seen before. And the stress induction was done with the trio social stress task where people um, give a speech um, and they also give and uh, have are asked to come backwards um, from you know 2539 steps of 13 and they're corrected when they make a mistake. So it's a very stressful um, uh, induction. And we did a manipulation check to see that it actually worked. And then we measure cognitive control again and the task. The follow-up again was done during the last two weeks of the semester during finals time. These are the pre-stress and post-stress and back errors. And you see that there is no increase in mean number of errors. This is baseline BDI and follow-up PDI, and again, that's not significant. This is baseline anxiety and post-stress anxiety, which shows that our stress index worked, the choice of the stress task. And this is um, negative life events, um, and as you can see, this shows that the follow-up um, during the two, last two weeks of the semester is actually a stressful time in life because we have a significant increase in number of life events. Now let's get um, to the main question. Is NBEC performance related to follow-up BDI? Um, what you can see here is that baseline BDI and post-stress NBEC errors are related, but not pre-stress NBEC errors. And the same is true for follow-up BDI. So what happens if we look at follow-up BDI controlling post-stress and back errors for pre um, and see whether post-stress and back errors predict follow-up BDI controlling for pre-stress errors, baseline BDI, and time between BDIs, um, because you know there was some variation in when, in, uh, when uh, people were testing. So that's what happens. Um, here you see baseline BDI, time in between, and pre-stress and back errors. Um, and only the baseline BDI obviously predicts um, the follow-up BDI of all of these predictors. However, when we include 
the post-stress endic errors, you'll see that they, they are actually a significant predictor, um, even controlling for baseline BDI time in between um, and pre-stressed endic errors. So this suggests that change in executive control following a stressor predicts depression symptoms during a stressful period of life. And we're currently conducting a follow-up study where we're looking at whether this is related to biological processes such as cortisol or pro-inflammatory cytokines, which may explain why we see this decrease in executive control when some people are under an acute stressor. So let's go back um, to our model. Again, stressful events may lead to negative effect, which then needs to be regulated so that it doesn't spiral into something like depression. But the regulation is very heavily dependent on cognitive functioning. Um, so cognitive biases and cognitive control deficits, which may be very prevalent in depression, may impair this self-regulation of affect, thereby leading um, to difficulties um, and sustained negative affect, which then leads into a depressive episode. And as I've shown in the last study, stressful life events may not just trigger the negative affect that, that leads into depression, but they may also further impair cognitive processes, particularly cognitive control. So there are obviously a number of open questions at this point, um, but let me just spend the last five minutes um, to talk about a specific important question, which is the question if these biases are so important for emotion regulation and may present such an important risk factor for psychopathology, as well as the cognitive control deficits, can we modify them? And if we can modify them, what are the consequences for cognition and affect? Because this may have important implications for improving our interventions. Just very quickly, um, this is some preliminary data from a pilot study that we conducted looking at attention training. And you've probably heard about this, a lot of people um, are currently doing this, but this is attention training done in a high-risk group. These are girls who are at high risk for developing depression because they have parents who have a history of depressive disorders themselves, particularly mothers with a history of recurrent depressive episodes. And what you can see here is the comparison between a sham and a real training group. So this is a, is a modified dot probe task that trains attention biases. And what you can see is that pre-training in both groups, we have a negative bias, so more of a bias to process negative material. Um, and um, we, actually, we also lack a positive bias in both of these groups. Then post-training, and this is only about a week of training, we'll see that there is no change really in the sham training group. However, in the real training group, we didn't do much to get rid of the, of the negative bias, but our real training group, post-training, has started to develop a very clear positive bias, which is something that we also see often in control participants. So this is some indication that training may work and not just in people who have the disorder, but also in high-risk groups before the onset of psychopathology. So let me turn to another set of training studies, and I'm very excited about these because we've done them a number of times now and they've worked out almost every time that we tried them. And this is looking at interpretation training. So the idea of whether we can change interpretation biases, and if we can change them, what are the consequences, again, for, co for other cognitive processes as well as affect. In the first study I want to present, what we did is positive versus negative interpretation bias training. And we looked at the effects of this training on interpretation and recall, as well as on stress reactivity. Because again, we're not that, you know, not just interested in changing cognition, but really we want to see a downstream effect on effective processing, sustained negative affect, um, affect under acute stressors, um, and things like that. So how does this training work? Um, there's an initial training phase. And in this training phase, people see ambiguous statements that, you know, then get resolved in, um, either a positive or negative direction. So let me give you an example. While at the hairdressers, you're persuaded to try a completely different cut. In doubt about it, you ask a friend who comments that the style makes you look. If you So the, everybody gets a statement. If you're in a negative training group, you get this incomplete word. Um, so, you know, terrible. Or in the positive training group, you would get the positive word, attractive. And as a participant, all you need to do, we don't tell you that we train anything here, all you need to do is complete um, this word fragment. 
And you do this over and over again. And if you're in a negative training group, the word fragment will resolve the ambiguity of the statement in a negative way. If you're in a positive training group, the word fragment will resolve it in a positive way. After we've trained you, um, we do fill a brief fill a task and then we enter a test phase. Test phase is the same for everybody, no matter which training group you were in. And for the participants, it's not obvious that this is different. So again, you'll see these ambiguous scenarios. So on the street, you bump into an old friend you haven't seen in a long time. She's too busy to stop, so you arrange to meet later in a bar. You arrive a little late, but the bar is empty, and a few minutes later, she's still not there again. All you have to do is complete the word fragment. And then we ask you another comprehension question. Was anyone else in the bar? After you've read all of those scenarios, we give you a recognition test. In the recognition test, we give you the title of the scenario and then ask you to rate four sentences one at a time according to the similarity to the original scenario. So we would tell you to say one if you think the sentence is very different, two fairly different, three fairly similar, four fairly similar. And the sentences again appear one at a time. So you arrange to meet in a bar and your friend arrives late, which would be a positive target. You arrange to meet in a bar, but your friend doesn't turn up, which would be a negative target. We also present two FOIL sentences that just control for the valence, but they are not related to the interpretation of the ambiguous scenario. After we're done with that, we do another follow-up test, which is a free recall test, where we again show you the title of the scenario, and then we ask you to remember as many details from the scenario as you can um, to see um, what your memory for the scenario looks like. And then we do a stress task. So let me show you some of the results. Um, in orange, you see the positive training group. In blue, you see the negative training group. And these were all students, so not a clinical sample yet, just to show you that this works. Um, on the left, you see the positive target, then the positive foil, then the negative target, then the negative foil. And what you can see here is that the similarity ratings, in the similarity rating, positive training groups indicates more similarity of the positive target to the original scenario than the negative training group. And we see the exact effect or reverse effect for negative targets. So the negative training group indicates more similarity of the sentences with the ambiguous scenario than the positive training group. And no group differences for the FOILs. When we look at free recall, um, what we look at here are the number of intrusions. So those are the number of details that people make, make up that have never been presented um, in the scenario. So these are um, you know, these are, you know, confabulations, basically. So new details that people provide. And as you can see, the positive training group is more likely to provide more positive details, whereas the negative training group is more likely to pro provide negative details. And there's no difference in the groups for neutral details. When we look at stress reactivity, this was an unsolvable anagram task, and we looked at self-esteem before and after um, they do this um, a stressful anagram task. And what you can see is self-esteem goes down in both groups, but it goes down more strongly in the negative compared to the positive training group. So what about depressed participants? Um, this, this was a study done using diagnostic interviews, two training sessions, and then assessment of interpretation biases, just as you've seen before, as well as a stress task. The stress task here was a speech threat. These were our participants by condition, and I want to just point out that we also had a no training group here. So these are people who just came in. We only did this for the MDD group and did not participate in the training so that we could see the baseline effects here. So let us look at the results. Again, these are the similarity ratings in the recognition test. And we're basically replicating our previous findings in the control group. So in the positive training, you're more likely to rate positive sentences as similar to the original scenario. In the negative training group, you're more likely to rate negative um, targets as being similar to the scenario compared to the positive training group. What happens in the depressed group? Basically the same thing. Um, so in the depressed group, if you're in a positive training group, you're more likely to rate the positive targets as being similar to the scenario compared to the negative training group. And no training basically shows the same as the, um, as the negative training group for the positive targets and no difference for the negative targets. So what you can see here, I most of point to what happens for the positive targets is that it looks like we're inducing positive interpretive bias in the MDD group. 
same if we look at free recall. So if you're in the positive training group, you recall more details that were never presented to you that are positive. In the negative training group, you recall more, net or more information that's negative that was never presented and no difference for neutral. MDD, same thing. They recall more positive details that were never presented. And they also recall more negative details when they were in the negative training group and no difference for neutral. And the no training group, you can see basically falls somewhere in between. So again, I want to point to the finding for, for the positive training here. Again, it looks like we're inducing a positive interpretation bias in MDD participants. So what about the stress test? Again, it was a speech threat. And we look not only at self-report, but also at changes in uh, very fair psychophysiology at baseline and anticipation. And what we find here, these are, this is heart rate. You see in the positive training group at baseline and at speech anticipation, negative training and the no training group. The no training group is elevated um, because this is the first time that they're actually coming into the lab. Um, so they're very scared. Um, whereas the positive and negative training group ha have been to the lab a number of times. So disregard the no training group um, at this point. But what you can see is that for the negative training group, you see more of a difference between baseline and anticipation. Um, so there's more of a physiological responding to the stressor compared to the positive training group. And the interpretation bias measure is actually correlated with um, these changes in heart rate. So to summarize, it looks like biases can be induced and they can be modified. And there's also indications that cognitive training control can be trained. And the training seems to affect other biases, mood and self-esteem, as well as physiological stress. So there's some future directions I just briefly want to point to. Um, as I said, we're really interested in examining the role of cognitive control, as well as examining in more detail emotion regulation. We're also very excited about the training direction of this work. So in terms of examining cognitive control, we're very interested in biological correlates of distress-related decline in executive control that we found um, in the study with Megan Quinn. And as I said, we're currently conducting a follow-up study where we're looking at cortisol as well as, as the role of um, neuroinflammation. Um, we're also interested in examining emotion regulation more closely by looking at individual differences in emotion regulation goals, as well as the role of interpersonal factors. We often think of emotion regulation as something that happens within the person, but it is actually something that happens very frequently in an interpersonal context. Um, so one study that we're just starting up um, is, is a study where we're looking at interpersonal emotion regulation, actually of positive effect, and whether that may be related um, to depression. And then training, um, as our findings suggest, it may be very important to look at people's cognition, particularly cognitive control, when they are under an acute stressor. However, most of the training tasks or most of the trainings that we do are trainings that we do by setting people in front of the computer screen in the lab and there's nothing much happening um, apart from that. So maybe we're not actually training in the context that's most important to us, which is um, when people are under an acute stressor. So what we want to do more um, is to actually look at um, training under an acute stressor um, to see if we can actually have changes in cognition um, that may then translate more into, into real life. We're also looking at interpretation bias training in at-risk children, um, and we're very interested in examining more closely neurocorrelates of training effects. So that's it. Um, thank you so much for your attention, um, and I really I um, want to um, thank my lab, my grad students, and the research assistants who've helped with the data collection on all of those studies. Um, thank you very much.